a uh, brief introduction um, to the seminar, uh, for, especially for those of you who have not attended the seminar before. Uh, the PCE3 seminar series takes place on the same day, same time, every three weeks, and it's intended to facilitate science discussion across uh, the different research fields uh, within prebiotic chemistry and early earth research. Um, the series is also an opportunity for us to showcase some of the great research that is being carried out by early career researchers specifically. And today is the 12th seminar of the series. And the topic of today's session is homochirality. And we get to hear from three NASA scientists today. Uh, the first is Dr. Danny Glavin from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. We also have Dr. Eric Parker from NASA Goddard as well, and Dr. Ali Fox from NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, in terms of the format, the first portion of the session will consist of three presentations from our guest speakers. And at the end of the session, after the three talks are finished, um, that's when we will open up the chat feature so that the audience can ask questions and we can have a bit of a group discussion. Um, before we get started, we do have a couple of quick announcements to make. So first off, we wanted to remind you that the social media team for PCE3 has recently created a new Twitter account. Um, the link uh, to the Twitter account is just right there on the slide in front, in front of you um, on the bottom left corner. We encourage all of you to follow that Twitter account if you're interested so you can read about cool PCE3 related uh, science, uh, hear about talks from members of our community and also learn about other research opportunities related to PCE3. And secondly, uh, we will be finishing our session today just a couple of minutes early so that we can do a quick audience poll. Um, the poll is completely voluntary, so you don't need to participate if you don't want to, but it should take just a couple of quick seconds so that we can gather some information about who our audience is, so what your career stage is, what you study, and where you're watching from. So stay tuned for that at the end of today's session. Um, yeah, so now to get started with today's presentations, we will first be hearing from Dr. Danny Glavin, who will be presenting a brief topical overview of today's session theme of homochirality. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, Danny, if you'd like to put up your slides and I'll just do a brief intro. Uh, so Danny Glavin, um, earned a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from the University of California at San Diego and a PhD in Earth Sciences from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He is currently the Associate Director of Solar System Science at NASA Goddard and a member of the Astrobiology Analytical Lab. Danny is leading the Organics Analysis Team on NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission, and he's also a member of the Curiosity Rover and the Mars Sample Return Science Teams. Um, so with that, Danny, if you'd like to give your presentation. Thank you, D Danielle. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about you know, a really exciting topic uh, for me, homochirality and chiral asymmetry. I think what makes this research so exciting is it's really it's highly interdisciplinary. And not only does it relate to prebiotic chemistry and, and, and trying to understand the origin of life on Earth, but it also impacts our strategy for life detection elsewhere. Um, there's no way I can give an overview in five minutes, so I'd really like to point you to some recent reviews um, that cover this topic in, in, in great detail. So homochirality is fundamental to life uh, here on Earth, and some even argue that it's a prerequisite for life. That you, you can't have self-replicating organisms uh, without this. Biology evolved to use homochiral polymers, that is uh, left-handed uh, amino acids and proteins and enzymes, as well as right-handed or D-sugars, ribose and 2-deoxyribose specifically in RNA and DNA. Um, the um, chiral uh, asymmetry is imperfect. Um, you know, there are peptides that contain both left and right-handed amino acids. There are organisms that can utilize um, L-sugars. Um, so it isn't perfect, but overall, you know, there's a predominance of uh, left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars uh, in life. Uh, 
interesting work about 30 years ago from Milton and Milton, where they showed that synthetic D amino acid base enzymes function just as well as the left-handed enzymes. So there's really no reason why life has to be uh, left-handed amino acid based. It could have been the other way around. Um, but when you try to build these uh, proteins with uh, equal mixtures of left and right-handed amino acids, they just don't function. It, uh, it inhibits the folding into higher, highly ordered structures. Uh, Stanley Miller and others uh, many years ago in the early 50s showed that you know, abiotic chemical reactions, uh, at least in the absence of a chiral driving force or seed, uh, result in equal mixtures of left and right-handed compounds. So of course, it's, it's, it's really a mystery how homochirality developed from what at least on the early earth was presumably a mixture of um, you know, left and right-handed uh, compounds. Um, some of the questions that you know, we're asking today, how was the chiral symmetry broken uh, in a racemic world? Um, when was the origin of homochirality? Did it precede life or did it come, or was it the result of biological activity, self-replicating entities? Um, why is life based on left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars not the other way around? Was it a simple coin flip, a matter of chance? And really to answer these questions, we look towards the analysis of extraterrestrial samples. We'll hear more, hear more about this from Eric. Uh, Prebiotic experiments, uh, modeling, um, as well as space flight measurements. Um, all of these things uh, will be needed to kind of provide the clues. I'm not going to get into too much detail about um, chiral symmetry breaking, but a lot of different mechanisms have been proposed. Uh, and we do know we do need to break the symmetry. Uh, and then you need to amplify it. Um, a lot of these mechanisms that have been proposed, for example, circularly polarized light, which has received a lot of attention, um, still require some amplification. Um, Studying meteorites, you know, one of, the, one of the explanations that we tend to like is a circular polarized light. This has been found, for example, in the Orion Nebula, about 70% polarization. And this polarized light can interact uh, with one enantiomer prefer preferably, either uh, through synthesis or destruction, uh, leading to small excesses. But again, the experiments have shown that these excesses amount to a few percent, you know, no, nowhere near the homochirality that we see in life. So there definitely needs to be an amplification mechanism. Um, one of the things that we've learned from, from meteorites, um, which has been pretty exciting since the discovery of a slight left-handed isovaline amino acid excesses in Murchison, that was uh, John Cronin and Sandra Pizzarello back in 97, is through the analysis of a variety of different carbon-rich meteorites, we've seen this interesting trend where the most aqueously altered meteorites seem to have the highest L isovaline excess. Um, so really pointing to um, some process in these uh, asteroid parent bodies for these meteorites involving liquid water that is driving the amplification of these small left-handed excesses. The enrichment mechanism remains unclear. So again, this is an area ripe for research, right? You know, how, how what is causing the amplification? Um, again, the evidence seems to point towards liquid water um, being involved, but uh, the exact mechanism really remains unclear. And just some final thoughts. Um, we haven't found any D amino acid excesses in any meteorite yet, uh, at least uh, amino acids with a single asymmetric carbon. Again, this, this suggests that at least our early solar system was biased towards L amino acids from the very beginning. Um, the evidence for L amino acid, and I didn't talk about it, but D sugar acid ex excesses in meteorites um, uh, suggests that they form by non-biological processes. Uh, which of course complicates the use of chirality as a biosignature if there are abiotic mechanisms to produce it. Um, some areas of future research that interest me in particular, uh, looking at the chirality of amino acid and peptides in extraterrestrial samples, as well as um, enantiomeric excesses and mineral separates to see if there's an association between the excesses and uh, certain mineral phases. Um, there are other chiral molecules like uh, lipids, uh, that have been proposed to be potential biosignatures. So uh, some, some research in that area as well. And then we need to continue to advance both lab and spaceflight instrument technology uh, to make these measurements. And with that, um, I'll leave it to, um, to Eric and Allie to, to take it forward. Looking forward to their talks. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Danny. Um, it's a great introduction to a very uh, complex topic. <laughs> uh, so, we will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Eric Parker. Um, Eric, if you'd like to get your presentation set up, I will do a brief introduction. So 
Eric Parker is a research scientist in the Astrobiology Analytical Lab, uh, same, lab as, same lab as Danny Glavin at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Eric completed a PhD in chemistry at Georgia Tech, where he studied analytical chemistry and prebiotic chemistry. His current work at Goddard is focused on the analyses of meteorites, asteroid sample return materials, and extraterrestrial microparticles for prebiotic organics to better understand the origin of life on Earth. And today he is presenting a talk called uh, Drawing Implications for the Origins of Homochirality from Meteoritic Organics. All right, thanks, Danielle. Um, so before I, I continue, I wanna make sure that there's uh, proper credit given to where credit is due, and that is due to a lot of the current and former members of the Astrobiology Analytical Lab. They've been heavily involved in this type of research, which uh, allows me to uh, present some of the content in the, these slides today. And so I wanna uh, give some credit to Danny Glavin, Aaron Burton, uh, who's now at Johnson Space Center, but was uh, a member of the Astrobiology Analytical Lab about 10 years ago or so. Uh, Jamie Elsla, Jose Aponte, and Jason Borkin. Um, so Danny, uh, left us off in a good spot talking about how uh, there's implications for meteorites uh, contributing to an antimeric excesses. And uh, there's a couple of meteorites that I think I wanna focus on just to give a snapshot of how uh, studies of meteorites can help us better understand the origin of homochirality or possible origins of homochirality. And the two that I wanna focus on uh, for these purposes are the Murchison meteorite and the Tagish Lake meteorites. So the Murchison meteorite fell in 1969 in Murchison, Australia, and it was a very large meteorite. It was about 100 kilograms of material that were recovered. And uh, because it's so heavily abundant, it's been very widely studied. And it has been studied quite a bit for an antimeric excess purposes as well. And the Tagish Lake meteorites were a series of different meteorite fragments that fell on Tagish Lake in British Columbia, Canada back in 2000. And there's been a few different fragments that have had interesting results come about from studying them for uh, amino acids and other organics. Uh, and the ones that I'm gonna focus on are fragments 5B, 11H, and 11I. Um, based on studying different chemical and physical properties of these different fragments, it's been clear that they have uh, uh, different aqueous alteration characteristics uh, where 11I is significantly the most aqueously altered and 5B uh, being the least. And that'll have some interesting implications for uh, organic studies uh, as we'll see here in a little bit. Um, so if we're trying to assess how meteorites or other types of extraterrestrial samples can contribute to or help to explain homochirality that's observed uh, in biological compounds or organic compounds, um, there's a, a variety of different ways to look through these meteorites for evidence of organics. And uh, I'm gonna show, give you an overview of what we do in the lab at the Astrobiology Analytical Laboratory uh, for how we prep and analyze samples. So we start up at the top left where we crush samples in sterilized mortar and pestle. Uh, so these are uh, materials that have been baked out at 500 degrees C overnight to remove any organics. and it, turns it from a rock or a crystal into a fine powder. And from that fine powder, we can then uh, do aqueous extractions or solvent extractions. We tend to do a hot water extraction to help uh, extract organics, uh, particularly amino acids from these materials uh, from the solid form to a liquid form where we can work with them better. Uh, and that's typically a 24 hour degree C, excuse me, 24 hour, 100 degree C hot water extraction. And after extraction, we can do acid hydrolysis. The purpose of the acid hydrolysis is to uh, effectively amplify the number of amino acids that are detected. So it can liberate bound amino acids or it can convert amino acid precursors into amino acids. Um, and then after acid hydrolysis, we can do purification steps. And so the purification step that we typically work with is desalting. So we will remove salts from the sample that we're working with, and that will help alleviate any downstream analytical issues that we might experience from uh, having salts present in the sample matrix. Um, 
And so following purification will often derivatize or uh, modify the, uh, the analytical targets. Uh, and this can help to increase analytical sensitivity and specificity for specific compounds that we're interested in. And we have a couple different ways by which we'll look for uh, things like amino acids and other types of organics. Uh, one is chiefly through a liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry based approach. And what this can do is this can help us to get uh, abundances of amino acids. Uh, we can determine uh, chirality of these species, how much of the analyte is present as the D amino acid or the L amino acid. But on top of that, we can also use gas chromatography with isotope ratio mass spectrometry. And what this can do is it can help us determine the isotopic ratios of uh, different elements within the compound. And this can be important for helping to assess the presence of uh, terrestrial compounds versus extraterrestrial compounds. Uh, so terrestrial compounds will tend to be more abundant in the lighter isotopes, whereas the extraterrestrial compounds uh, can be relatively more abundant in the heavier isotopes. So if we take a look at just an example of what some of the data looks like when we look at these meteorites, let's take a look at uh, Murchison. You can see that there's uh, what we have here is a series of stacked chromatograms uh, with retention time on the bottom and increasing number of carbons in the carbon chain going from uh, bottom to the top. And this is an example of using LCMS data. We can see that as the carbon number grows, there's evidence for significantly more complex uh, chemical characteristics to the point where if we get all the way up to say C8, C9, there's myriad different peaks that uh, remain unidentified because the analysis of those types of complex mixtures is incredibly difficult and it still takes a long time to try to develop the methods necessary to be able to uh, refine those identifications. Uh, one thing I want to point out is uh, the C5 amino acids can be particularly useful for uh, identifying protein or non-protein amino acids, meaning amino acids that are either incorporated in a protein synthesis or not. Uh, and for Murchison, there's been a uh, complete separation of, uh, an, excuse me, complete identification of uh, C5 isomers. Uh, in particular, I want to note uh, the D isovaline and L isovaline uh, right here in the middle of the screen um, of the C5 trace. We'll, we'll touch bases with that particular compound later. Uh, and if we also look, let's see, I'm trying to move my slide, for, there we go. If we also look at uh, similar types of data from Tagish Lake, um, we can see that uh, up in the top left, we have procedural blanks that just demonstrate that uh, the analytical reagents are, are fairly clean. And uh, in the bottom left, we have the 5B fragment. In the bottom right, we have the 11H fragment. And in the top right, we have the 11I fragment. So that follows a pattern of increasing aqueous alteration. And you can see that from 5B to 11H, as you have an increase in aqueous alteration, you also have what appears to be an increase in complexity until the point where you get to such a significantly aqueously altered uh, state in the 11I fragment, where you actually have a reduction of um, amino acid complexity and abundance. And this is consistent with what's been observed in the literature where uh, very high levels of aqueous alteration are actually correlated with a lower total abundances of amino acids. So we talked about isovaline a second ago. Um, let's sort of drill down on isovaline and how we can potentially use it uh, for studying origins of extraterrestrial analytes and also an antimeric excesses. So one, a couple of factors that make isovaline a really good target analyte for this type of purpose is it's a non-protein amino acid, meaning it does not get incorporated into protein synthesis. And as a result, it's relatively rare in biology. That doesn't mean it's non-existent, it just means it's uh, very low presence. Um, and another thing that's interesting about isovaline is it's got a very slow racemization rate, meaning it doesn't interconvert convert between the enantiomers of the amino acid. It's a very slow process. So it's relatively stable and uh, 
a, any excesses in the enantiomeric composition wouldn't necessarily be due to racemization alone. So when we look through uh, meteorites like Murchison, there are evidence of L enantiomeric excesses of isovaline of this non-protein amino acid, and it's upwards of 18 and a half percent more L isovaline than the D enantiomer. And this is a really interesting finding, and uh, it's unclear why that might be the case. And so uh, it doesn't appear that it's from terrestrial contamination because isovaline is rare in um, terrestrial chemistry, as uh, terrestrial biology. And uh, there appears to be some level of correlation between the aqueous alteration of the parent body of a meteorite and the amount of L excess that's observed. And, and this has been observed in a variety of different meteorites, including uh, fragments of the uh, Tagish Lake meteorite and uh, also this Murchison meteorite. We're going to look into uh, how this plays into the homochirality picture. So, if we look at uh, Tagish Lake, uh, this is also a series of sta stacked chromatograms. We have the standard on the bottom, a blank above that, a procedural blank. We have 5B as the third uh, chromatogram from the bottom, uh, followed by, excuse me, uh, 11I, then 5B, and 11H going from bottom to top. And what we can see is that there's uh, mostly racemic ev uh, evidence of L. isovaline in Tagish Lake. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence of possible L and antimeric excess in 5B, not much, but just a little bit. Um, and so we've seen this in, in a variety of different meteorites. So let's sort of examine what might be causing this uh, and, and how it plays into the picture. So uh, Dandy showed a slide similar to this earlier, and I'll just uh, reiterate um, that what we're seeing is that if the meteorite species have aqueously altered parent bodies, they tend to be correlated with higher amounts of L isovaline excesses. You can see the two least aqueously altered meteorites pointed out there in the middle. Their L and antimeric excesses tend to hover around zero, so very racemic. Whereas if you move leftward on the graph, you're moving towards uh, more aqueously altered species. And you can see there's a trend going uh, from bottom to top, right to left, of increasing aqueous, uh, excuse me, increasing L isovaline excesses. And interestingly, it's worth noting that D isovaline excesses have not yet been uh, reported. So based on looking at these two meteorites and other meteorites as well, we can start to get a little clearer picture of how we can use meteorites to help distinguish from uh, biochemistry here on life, in life here on Earth, and what type of chemistry or organic chemistry we can see in meteorites. And so from life, we can uh, deduce that there are the 20 essential amino acids that are used in protein synthesis. These are exclusively of the L enantiomer. Whereas when we study meteorites, these are uh, non-terrestrial bodies that uh, have a great number of amino acids, about 100 different amino acids that have been identified so far. And the amino acids that are chiral tend to be racemic, meaning they have an equal amount of the D and the L enantiomer. But there are select examples where you can have L enantiomeric amino acid excesses as high as 60% and, and will uh, talk about that number in a little bit here, uh, but we're not seeing any D excesses. Uh, also, what we can uh, say in this comparison is that life tends to use uh, alpha hydrogen amino acids in protein. It has a preference for those types of amino acids. Uh, doesn't mean it uses them exclusively, but has a preference for them. Uh, whereas amino acids that are observed in meteorites don't tend to have this type of uh, preference for isomers of amino acids. Instead, you can get a, a complete suite of the structural diversity of amino acids. You can get alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all the way to omega amino acids. Uh, and if we're talking about uh, isotopes, isotopes we talked about earlier are very helpful for de deducing uh, terrestrial versus extraterrestrial presence uh, in Terrestrial samples, you tend to have the light isotopes, as we talked about, whereas in the uh, extraterrestrial samples, we can get much more of the heavy isotopes, 
help us uh, delineate between um, these types of uh, environments that are forming these amino acids. So uh, we talked a moment ago about 60% excesses. Um, and so an example of that is L-aspartic acid, a protein amino acid that's been observed in the Tagish Lake meteorite, upwards of 60%. Now at a first glance, uh, you might see 60% L-excess of a protein amino acid and think that it's uh, terrestrial contamination. Uh, but when you look closer at some of the other amino acid chemistry, you can look at alanine, another uh, chiral protein amino acid, that has uh, a racemic mixture of approximate D equals uh, L. Um, and so it, it begs the question, why would there be so much of an excess or how would there be so much of an excess of the L-aspartic acid? And is this really, uh, really an extraterrestrial characteristic? Well, we, we can use the GCMS IRMS technique that we talked about earlier to help evaluate this a little closer. And if we do that, you know, we can see, okay, we have this 60% excess of the L-aspartic acid in Tagish Lake. Uh, what would be the uh, isotopic values of the D-aspartic acid and the L-aspartic acid? And if we look at the delta 13C values for these, we can see that both the D-aspartic acid and the L-aspartic acid have a very positive values for that, indicative of extraterrestrial synthesis. If they were uh, terrestrial, we would expect them to be uh, negative values. Um, so that's very exciting to see that we can use this type of analytical chemistry to differentiate between uh, terrestrial and extraterrestrial, even if the initial chirality measurements seem to suggest that there's a terrestrial contamination. Um, so when we're talking about where these types of L and antimeric excesses may originate from, it's important to have a baseline understanding of how amino acids might be formed uh, within the parent body asteroid. Um, and so what we can, oops, excuse me, getting ahead of myself here. What we know is that uh, alpha amino acids tend to be dominated by Strecker synthesis on the parent body, but we can also get beta, gamma, and delta amino acids uh, through Michael addition formation processes and N omega amino acids can be formed in the gas phase, possibly by uh, Haber-Bosch, Haber, uh, Fischer-Tropsch type reactions. Um, so if we expect uh, these types of reactions to lead to uh, little or no enantiomeric excesses, racemic amino acids, um, where would we be getting uh, this type of L and antimeric excesses that we've been observing here. Well, there are a variety of different possible explanations for this. We're going to talk about some of them here. Danny introduced uh, this one earlier. We'll start with circularly polarized light. So this is a phenomenon where you have a light wave uh, where at each point along the wave, the light is uh, has a constant magnitude and it's rotating at a constant rate in a direction that is perpendicular to the direction of the light wave. And Danny mentioned how this can uh, preferentially interact with uh, one enantiomer or the other. Uh, we talked about uh, how this can be originated from different parts of the solar system and, uh, and it can only lead, what, what we've seen so far in the literature is it tends only to produce uh, very small amounts of L enantiomeric excesses. So if we see excesses of a few percent in a meteorite, that may be uh, at least partially uh, due to circularly polarized light, but it doesn't help us understand where these very large L enantiomeric excesses, 20%, 60%, where, there's, where these might be coming from. So there's got to be alternative explanations for these. Uh, another potential explanation is an isotropy. Uh, so this is a, a concept where you have a material and this material can uh, exhibit properties with different values if those values are being measured uh, along an axis in a different direction. And uh, here what we have in this figure is um, the structure of isovaline. And what we can see is that anisotropies tend to have uh, very, lead to very small amino acid and antimeric excesses. Uh, 
Uh, and so still this doesn't explain where we're seeing these large excesses coming from. Um, and so we need to keep looking for other uh, alternative explanations. Um, one potential way to evaluate this is due to uh, racemization and enrichment of enantiomers during crystallization, uh, excuse me, uh, in crystallization uh, during the aqueous alteration process. So there's a couple different ways that this can be evaluated. On the left side, we'll talk about the conglomerate crystals. Uh, these are um, crystals that are um, combined together, uh, typically as uh, rock formations. And then there's an example on the right of uh, racemic crystals. So if we're looking at uh, conglomerate crystals, there's a process by which racemization actually increases the enantiomeric excess. Uh, and this can help to develop large enantiomeric excesses. In the contrast, uh, racemic crystals, uh, typically for alpha hydrogen amino acids, uh, you tend to get racemization that reduces the enantiomeric excess, produces uh, the racemic mixtures. And so what this gives us is a little bit of insight into how these larger L enantiomeric excesses may potentially be formed uh, through conglomerate crystals. Um, but that's not necessarily the case for all amino acids uh, like alanine. So uh, if we're evaluating what some of the origins of these chiral distributions might be, it's helpful to evaluate the different scenarios in which we have uh, differences between the D enantiomers and the L enantiomers of amino acids and what might be those causes. So if we start on the far left side, we have uh, a scenario in which the L enantiomer is greatly in excess of the D enantiomer. Um, as we talked about earlier, that could be a terrestrial contamination or it could be due to um, uh, extant biology. Um, on the flip side, if we have D that's significantly greater than the L enantiomer, this could be due to extant biology. If we have racemic mixtures, D to L, uh, that's usually either an abiotic characteristic or it's extinct biology. Uh, and then if we have D slightly greater than L, this could be due to extinct biology. And then lastly, L slightly greater than D, this could be an abiotic synthesis process where we're seeing, we're, we're seeing a small L enantiomeric excesses in certain meteorites, or it could be due to extinct biology. Now, the most interesting potential uh, biosignatures for these are cases where you have uh, D slightly greater than L or D significantly greater than L, but these uh, have not been reported yet in the meteorite literature. And so it's useful to try to figure out how we can uh, better assess what might be the origins of these excesses, um, whether they are uh, terrestrial or extraterrestrial, and uh, that's where the isotopic measurements come in. So we can look for isotopic differences in amino acids based on the isotopes of their carbons, their nitrogens, and their hydrogens. Um, and we can also do the same for sugars. So here's a, a graph that plots the delta D uh, on the y-axis and the uh, delta C values on the x-axis. And what we can see here is that if we are looking at amino acids, we would expect these isotopic values to be more in this green area down here in the bottom left. So these would be uh, negative values, negative isotopic values. Whereas if we're looking for uh, evidence of extraterrestrial synthesis, we would look uh, more in the blue region, these would be positive isotopic values. Um, whereas the sugars tend to be a little bit closer uh, uh, to, to zero. So uh, I, what I wanna do is I wanna uh, wrap up and give way for our next speaker here, and I'll just go over a few uh, points quickly. Uh, so when looking for in antimeric excesses, isovaline has been a very useful compound for these purposes. It's been found in a number of different meteorites, uh, and it's been uh, observed with a varying degree of L and antimeric excesses, up to 18.5% uh, in Murchison. Um, and there's a potential for different mechanisms by which isovaline could have been amplified during aqueous alteration of the parent body. Um, uh, excuse me, yeah, during aqueous alteration of the parent body, um, we talked about the um, crystallization 
uh, during aqueous alteration as uh, one conglomerate crystallization to help uh, really amplify it uh, to a large degree. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to help understand these processes. Um, and they can also uh, be used to look at uh, the L-aspartic acid, acid excesses in uh, Tagish Lake. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned the uh, conglomerate amino acids uh, in the crystallization scheme in aqueously altered meteorites. Um, and it should be noted that D excesses have not been reported. So we're only seeing this L and antimeric excess, uh, which is an interesting implication for the homochirality, the origins of homochirality, uh, depending on uh, L amino acids. Um, and we can also say that there's evidence for these L and antimeric excess, excesses to be formed by uh, abiotic processes. Um, so uh, I'll thank you for your attention. And I think we're holding questions until afterwards. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll give way to our next speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Eric. Um, and yes, you're, you're right. Uh, we will hold the questions until um, after our next speaker is finished and then we'll kind of have a, a group discussion. So, um, so our next speaker is Dr. Ali Fox. And Ali, if you'd like to put up your slides, then I will just do a brief intro. So um, Ali Fox is a NASA postdoctoral fellow at Johnson Space Center. Her research uh, focuses on how the molecular and isotopic characteristic of organic material affects their preservation and evolution into biomolecules. Ali's work in particular focuses on the role of organic mineral interactions in influencing these processes. Prior to her NPP or her postdoc at NASA, um, Ali completed her PhD in geosciences at Penn State University in 2020. And today she is presenting a talk titled, uh, Does Chirality Influence the Stability of Amino Acid Copper Complexes in the Salt-Induced Peptide Formation? And with that, Ali, you can go ahead. Okay. Um... So like she said, I am Allie and I am a postdoc at Johnson Space Center. And I'm actually presenting today what I refer to as my like uh, quarantine banana bread project. Um, when I first started my postdoc in 2020, we were still in the height of COVID. And so I actually couldn't go on site and do anything in the lab. Um, and so we sort of picked up this computational project and ran with it and it turned into this whole thing. Um, and what we were trying to understand was whether or not chirality influences the stability of the copper amino acid complexes that are critical in the salt-induced peptide formation reaction. And we did that by looking at density functional theory calculations. So uh, if you're not familiar, when amino acids polymerize into peptides and eventually proteins, they do so via condensation reactions. And these reactions actually release water as a product. And so as a result, they're not thermodynamically favorable in the aqueous environments we might have expected to be prevalent on early Earth. Um, so we need to come up with some other type of reaction pathway or some sort of catalyst that will allow these polymerization to reactions to happen spontaneously in those aqueous environments. And one of the really popular ones is the salt-induced peptide formation or the SPIF reaction. Um, and I gave you guys on the slide sort of the whole reaction pathway of the SPIF reaction. But what I really want you to focus on is actually this active complex on step number two. Um, you can see that what we have here is basically a divalent cation. In most cases, uh, people do use copper just because it's the most efficient at doing this reaction, but any divalent cation will do. And then you have two amino acids that are sort of brought together by this divalent cation and then a chlorine anion that's actually acting as a dehydrating agent. Um, and so all of these pieces together facilitate the eventual formation of a peptide bond in an aqueous environment. And the reason that this got so much popularity sort of in the prebiotic research world um, is because the requirements for this reaction are pretty easily met in a prebiotic environment. So first things first, you need amino acids. Um, we know from Danny and Eric's talks that those are available in spades on prebiotic earth, um, or at least easy to come by for these reactions. They can be delivered via meteorites. We also know that there are other abiotic processes on early earth that could have led to the formation of amino acids. So we expect amino acids are present. 
Um, we also know that for the most part, there's not evidence to suggest that the sodium chloride concentration in Earth's ocean has really fluctuated greatly over time. Uh, so we think it's a reasonable assumption to assume that there was enough sodium chloride present on early Earth to act as the dehydrating agent in this reaction. Maybe the trickiest part of all of this is actually having divalent copper. Um, divalent copper does need oxygen to be stable, but even at the sort of low, low, low concentrations of oxygen on early earth, there still was theoretically enough to stabilize um, divalent copper. And there were also potentially other divalent cations that could um, maybe less efficiently, but still facilitate this reaction. And then lastly, we needed some sort of moderately high temperatures, um, but the Earth's crust was, you know, still cooling down at this point. So these temperatures aren't unreasonable. And I think most importantly, there have been a lot of sort of laboratory experiments trying to mimic maybe prebiotic puddles or salt lakes that were experiencing heat induced evaporation that could have been present on early earth um, that did lead to successful peptide formation. So it does seem like taken together, the SPIF reaction um, is prebiotically plausible. And so the other reason that it's such an attractive, oops, sorry, skipped ahead. The other reason that it's such an attractive option is that it actually has a lot of characteristics that make sense when we look at modern proteins. Um, so Eric sort of touched on this a little bit. Life tends to favor those alpha amino acids. And so does this reaction when forming peptides because the alpha amino acids form a better complex uh, formation with the copper cation, we tend to see better polymerization of those types of amino acids. Um, we also see that this reaction is pretty ubiquitous among alpha amino acids. So there's been other sort of polymerization reactions that will maybe work for some amino acids and not others. But the SPIF reaction so far works for everyone. Um, so it's very versatile. And then lastly, and sort of what the point of today's seminar is about is for certain amino acids, this reaction is enantioselective, meaning that it's going to preferentially polymerize the L amino acids um, over the D amino acids and potentially played an important role in the origin of biological homochirality. Um, and before I get too far into this, I did uh, realize late last night that I did a bad thing and was sort of interchangeably using the R and S configuration to describe chirality um, and the L and D configuration to describe chirality. So please forgive me. Um, in this talk, they are interchangeable. That's not always the case. Uh, but for today's purposes, if you see R, think of D. If you see S, think of L or vice versa, depending on what you're familiar with. But just something to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, but jumping back into the SPIF reaction, there have been a lot of experimental studies that have shown that this reaction is an antiselective for some amino acids. Um, the plots that I'm showing you here are from Fitz et al. in uh, 2007. On your y-axis, you have the dipeptide yields in percent, and on the x-axis, you have the number of evaporation cycles. Um, and then they actually differentiate the results by the L enantiomer shown in dark gray and the D enantiomer shown in light gray. And they did this experiment for three different types of amino acids, both with and without a glycine catalyst. Um, and what I really wanna draw your attention to is that in some cases, like for valine on the top left, you can see a really strong preference for this L enantiomers. So it's preferentially polymerizing the L enantiomers into these peptides. When you contrast that with like lysine where there's maybe a slight enrichment in the L enantiomers or proline where it almost looks like the D enantiomers favored or maybe it's even just racemic, um, it's kind of confusing as what could be causing this. It's hard for us to say that this is, you know, the source of biohomochirality without understanding the mechanism behind this process. And because we only see it for some amino acids and not others, and these results are pretty significantly influenced by the addition of a glycine cat catalyst, um, it's hard for us to really understand why this is occurring. And so when people were trying to come up with a hypothesis of this, what they came back to was what's known as the parity violation energy difference. Um, Danny kind of touched on this in his overview. And I just want to preface this with, I am no quantum physicist, but essentially what this is, is it's an extremely small energy difference between enantiomers. Um, and when I say small, I mean small, like femtojoule per mole small. And we actually, it's so small, we can't model it using density functional theory methods. Um, they're not refined enough for that. But we can measure this difference by looking at changes in rotational transitions. Um, and we also know that this energy difference is proportional to the atomic number of the chiral um, center. So in this case, it would be carbon, but for example, in our molecules, it would be copper, which is heavier. So we know that there could be a larger parity violation energy difference. And 
it's with this in mind that the hypothesis was put forward by Fitz et al. that um, this inherent chirality, or sorry, this inherent uh, parity violation is actually being influenced um, by the distortion of the active complex. So what we have here are two um, models of the active complex. On the right, you have L-alanine, and on the left, you have L-proline. Experimental results showed that the alanine experiments did have an enantioselectivity, and the proline experiments did not. And so what these authors think is causing that is actually the distortion of this active complex. So they refer to it as the equatorial plane. It's really hard to see because these are just 2D models um, sitting on your screen. But effectively, you have a plane that's made up of the copper atom and then the nitrogen and oxygen of one amino acid and then the oxygen of another amino acid and a chlorine. And based on what amino acids are attached to that copper atom, you can have different um, distortions of that plane. And what they're suggesting is the greater distortion that you see in that plane, the more in antiselectivity you'll see because you're amplifying that inherent energy difference. And so the examples that they have for L-alanine is it has a di dihedral angle of 6.5. So it's more distorted than this proline, which has a dihedral angle of 0.51 degrees. Um, the issue with that is that they've only looked at this hypothesis for one type of active complex. So most of the preliminary work on the SPIF reaction assumed that the active complex is a monodentate structure with one protonated amino acid. So that means it's just interacting with this copper atom at the oxygen. And then one neutral amino acid that's a bidentate structure interacting with the nitrogen and the oxygen atom. Um, what we know from subsequent work is that there's a potentially another type of complex that could be formed using two neutral amino acids to form a double bidentate structure. Um, and that's been seen in computational work shown here from Ramola et al. Uh, 2007. And maybe even more convincing for the experimentalists in the room, um, it's actually been verified using some FTI, FTIR spectroscopy. Uh, this is some work from Beristova et al. in 2017, and what they were actually doing was forming these copper amino acid crystals um, and then measuring their vibrational frequencies using FTIR spectroscopy and then comparing that to the calculated um, vibrational frequencies from models of these double bidentate uh, active complexes, and they saw good agreement. So that suggests that Although it's very possible that we could form both types of structures, it's maybe more likely that we might see these double bidentate structures. And so with that in mind, we sort of formed two research questions. Um, the first was, do we see significant differences in the stability or the geometry of the homochiral versus the heterochiral active complexes? And the second is, do we see the same geometry differences when looking at the neutral double bidentate structures consistent with the previous hypotheses that enantioselectivity is being driven by this distortion of that equatorial plane. And our motivation for our first question is really driven by, I think what's motivating Eric and Danny's research, which is at what point in the formation of proteins did we need to worry about chirality? Um, so if we know most abiotic reactions are making this racemic mixture, one possibility for what could be driving this preference for the L enantiomer could be that when these um, polymerize into peptides, homochiral, peptides are preferred. Um, so they're more energetically stable for some reason. If that was the case, then you wouldn't need to explain this preference of the L over D enantiomers in the um, formation of the amino acids. It could be occurring via the polymerization reaction. On the flip side of that, if we don't really see a difference between the homochiral complexes and the heterochiral complexes, then perhaps you do need some sort of mechanism that would explain um, why you have an L preference that occurs prior to polymerization. So that was really what was driving um, our question about comparing those two types of structures. And then for the second question, we were really motivated by just how limited this hypothesis had been tested. So it had really only looked at that one type of active complex where you have the protonated and the neutral amino acid in the monodentate and bidentate structure. And so we really wanted to see if this idea that it was driven by the distortion of this complex held up when you used different types of um, copper amino acid active complexes. So how did we do this? Um, like I said, this is my quarantine project. So we did this with purely computational tools. We were using density functional theory calculations to model hetero and homochiral copper amino acid complexes. 
Uh, I know that DFT is not a very common tool in the astrobiologist tool belt. So if you're not really familiar with this, sort of the bird's eye explanation of what this is, is it takes a many bodied perspective. So it takes a molecule and instead of looking at every single electron as its own individual um, component with its own set of coordinates, it looks at the entire molecule as an electron cloud. What this does is it simplifies what would be three n and being your number of electron coordinates to just three coordinates, the x, y, and z of the whole cloud. Um, and this allows us to calculate different energies and geometries in a reasonable time frame. Um, and if you are familiar with DFT, just to bring you up to speed on what we were doing, we use the B, H, and H, Y, L, P functional. And that just refers to the set of equations we were using to make this calculation at the 6-31 plus plus GDP level of theory. And that's just referring to our basis set. Um, the bigger bit the basis set, the better your result is, the more accurate, but it comes at a computational cost. So we're always trying to balance how big our basis set is with how long we want to make this you know, code run on the computer. And we use these to optimize optimize the geometries of our different models and then calculate their free energy. We focused on the neutral form, so that's the double bidentate structures of valine and alanine, both of which do show in antiselectivity and experimental work, and then also proline, which doesn't. And we did this in the cis and trans formation shown here. Um, and Basically, we just did that to try to compare it to more experimental works because we know that both of these types of um, complexes do exist. So jumping straight into our results and starting with the least exciting one, um, we did not see a significant energy difference between the homochiral and the heterochiral complexes. I am showing you guys the results for alanine, but this was true for valine and proline as well. Um, just to orient you on the y-axis, you have the relative energy differences from uh, the lowest energy complex. The light blue uh, bars show you the energy differences for the trans isomers, and the dark blue bars show you the energy differences for the cis isomers. Um, and you can see within the same isomer family, we have relatively small energy differences, like somewhere on the order of five to 10 kilojoules per mole. Um, and based on some sort of subsequent work that we did sort of toying with the initial geometries and re rerunning the models, we know that these energy differences are purely the result of um, slight rotations within the molecule. And what I mean by that is if you look at this RR um, cis alanine complex in the top left and compare it to the RS complex in the top middle, you can see there's a methyl group on the top right of both complexes that sort of slightly rotates. And it's these little types of rotations that aren't necessarily affecting the stability of the molecule that lead to these sort of small energy differences between the molecules. So unfortunately, we didn't see any crazy differences between the homochiral and the heterochiral complexes. Um, we did see a very significant difference between the cis and the trans isomers with the trans isomers being um, significantly more energetically favorable. Uh, and this is actually consistent with previous modeling and experimental results. So that was a nice sanity check on our models um, compared to other work that's been done. Moving into some of the geometric parameters that we looked at, one of the things that we focused on was the minimum oxygen to nitrogen distance between opposing amino acids. And the reason we wanted to look at that is those are what will eventually form the peptide bond. So it's reasonable to assume that if you minimize that difference, you might more easily facilitate the polymerization reaction. Um, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the trans isomer results. You can see they were pretty consistent between different chiralities um, and they were all much smaller than the cis isomers. So this is sort of more evidence that the trans isomer is just going to be the better option for polymerization. Um, the cis isomers were less straightforward. You can see for alanine and proline, it does appear that the homochiral complexes um, do have a smaller distance between the oxygen and the nitrogen atoms. Um, and that could potentially mean that they're more likely to polymerize because they have the shorter distance compared to the heterochiral complex. But that sort of falls apart when you look at valine, which doesn't really have a consistent trend. Um, and so it's unclear if this is, you know, sort of real result that we can hang our hat on or something that's just kind of a blip in the data. We'd have to make more models and probably also do some experimental work to draw a, uh, a concrete conclusion. We also looked at something called the planar torsion angle, um, and this we just focused on our trans models because they were um, the more energetically favorable models. And 
effectively what this is, is it's an attempt to try to capture how distorted this molecule is. So very similar to the dihedral angle um, that previous models have used. So we were expecting based on those previous hypotheses that we would see the highest torsion angle um, in like valine or alanine, and we would see a lower torsion angle in proline because it was the one that didn't show an antiselectivity. But what we actually saw was the opposite. Um, they didn't vary significantly. In some cases, there was only like a half a degree difference. So it's not even clear if this is like a real trend, but importantly, we did not uh, recreate the results of the previous hypotheses that were using those protonated monodentate bidentate structures. We did not see the same sort of contorsion trends um, looking at our own double bidentate structures. So putting all of this back into the context of our original research questions, um, First, we didn't see a significant difference in the stability of the homochiral versus the heterochiral active complexes. The energy differences were pretty much 100% attributed to slight rotations in R groups or methyl groups or hydrogens on the oxygen or the water group, what have you. And there wasn't a significant difference that um, could explain like a, a difference in the stability that would lead to some sort of homochiral preference. Um, the geometry is a little bit more complicated of a story. Uh, in the trans isomers, there's no correlation with chirality and the minimum distance between the oxygen and nitrogen atoms, but there is sort of like a patchy trend in the cis isomers. And so this is one where I don't think that there's strong evidence um, for a significant stability difference or geometry difference between the homochiral and heterochiral compounds, but there is a difference and we would need to do more work uh, to know for sure. Moving into our second question, do we see the same geometry differences when looking at neutral double bidentate complexes consistent with the previous hypothesis that the um, distortion of the equatorial plane is driving that enantiselectivity? The answer is it's complicated. Um, like I said, the minimum oxygen and nitrogen differences in the cis isomers may have some sort of story going on, um, but there wasn't a significant trend. What's much more confusing is that we saw the opposite trend um, looking at our torsion angle. So we saw that proline had, in theory, the most distorted active complex, and it had the um, it was the one that didn't show any enantiselectivity. So that would suggest that this hypothesis does not show up. The problem is, is that we're not really sure that we're comparing apples to apples. So we're using a planar torsion angle. Um, they were using a dihedral angle. It's unclear if we're comparing the same thing. And it's also unclear if, if we're looking at the same type of equatorial plane because we have a different bonding environment on that copper atom. So perhaps this isn't the best um, comparison that we could be making. And so that's sort of where the work is sitting today. This is an ongoing project that I'm still working on. Um, and so what I'm doing right now is actually trying to come up with a different framework in which to compare these models. Uh, and what we're using is called the continuous chirality measure. Effectively, what this is, is it takes a molecule and assumes an ideal achiral form of that molecule. And that's what this red uh, molecule is showing. And then you superimpose your molecule onto that and you basically measure the distance between each atom. And it tells you it's deviation from achirality. And you can actually plug that into this equation and get a measure. And so what we're hoping is that this might be a better comparative tool um, to try to see if there are trends associated with the experimental results that we've seen. And then sort of just moving forward uh, more broadly, um, this isn't work that I'm necessarily pursuing, but I do think there's a lot of opportunity here for more research, looking at how this reaction is influenced in different environmental conditions. So like I said, there's sort of two active complexes that can be formed and in theory, those should be heavily influenced by the pH. Um, for example, if you have a very low pH for your SPIF reaction, you'd have more protonated amino acids. And so you might be preferentially making this complex on the left versus a more circumneutral pH where you might be preferentially making this complex on the right. And so it would be really interesting to compare how um, enantiselectivity changes at these different pH reactions for the same amino acid. And it could help us answer some of these questions that we have um, based on this modeling work. And so that's where we're at right now. I do want to give a shout out to my collaborators. Um, Jason Bodiger at UTEP is, has been the density functional theory guru on this entire project. Um, and he's answered a lot of my questions as I've sort of picked this up uh, in my quarantine time. And then Aaron Burton and Eve Berger are my advisors at Johnson Space Center. And this was sort of their 
um, musings that led to this project forming. They do a lot of work in this space and they've been really helpful uh, understanding my results. Um, and then here's my contact information. And then I think we're going to move to sort of group questions. So thanks everyone for listening. Great, thank you so much, Ali. That was great. Um, all of the presentations today were amazing. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, we're gonna move on to the Q&A portion of the session. So um, uh, James Aguchi will open up the chat and um, you're welcome. You know, if you have a question for any of the speakers, you can type, type it in right there in the chat or you can also use the raise hand feature and um, we will call on you and you can uh, turn on your microphone and, and answer that way. Um, and yeah, the questions are for Ali, Eric, and Danny. So um, whoever whoever you'd like to ask. Uh, Kevin Devine, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Indeed, yes, we're back on, we're back in the UK to five hours behind you. We're back on the, we fell back at the end of March rather than the beginning. So I missed the last presentation because of that asynchronous time shift. Anyway, question for Eric, a couple of, a couple of questions. Um, about amino acids that you detect in meteorites, I don't think I've ever come across the cysteine or arginine and there's, there's quite a few that, uh, would you say they are biogenic in origin rather than abiotic? It's one question. And the, the next question concerns the excesses of L-glutamic acid in comparison with the excesses of D-sugars that you see, that we've seen in, in uh, meteorites. Are they, are they about the same? Or is there a greater abundance of the L-amino acids over the D-sugar? Um, okay, so the first question was pertaining to um, cysteine, yeah, cysteine and arginine, arginine. histidine as well as right. another one that comes to mind. Yes, right. So these are uh, certainly challenges. Um, there's analytical challenges associated with detecting these analytes, um, and there's a sample processing challenges, being able to uh, extract these amino acids, purify them and then analyze them. Uh, the other amino acids that we tend to look for tend to be much easier to extract and purify mm -hmm. than uh, compounds like arginine and uh, lysine. Uh, histidine certainly has been uh, a challenge to identify. It hasn't been identified yet. Um, and cysteine, you know, we've seen that in Laboratory experiments uh, being syn uh, synthesized, but, uh, but you're right, we haven't seen it in meteorites yet. Whether or not they are bi biogenic or extraterrestrial, um, I guess I can't say uh, one way or the other. It, it would be helpful to have some data to rely on uh, from meteorites uh, to be able to make a, a stronger conclusion on that, but um, I don't think I can at this point uh, based on the uh, data available. Um, and as for your second question, um, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping around between questions. Please remind me that was, uh, the, the excess, how is the, the I think the, uh, the excesses of D ribose and other D sugars that have been detected in meteorites, are they similar or less than the excess of, of glutamic, L-glutamic acid over D-glutamic acid? You know, I think they are less, um, I would like to, uh, actually ask Danny to confirm. I, I think that the L-aspartic acid excesses are, are greater, uh, but uh, Danny, did you have any extra comment on that? Uh, if D-ribose, if its excesses are comparable to- Yeah, so we actually, ribose has been detected, um, but the chirality has not been measured yet. Uh, we're working on that. That was a paper by Furukawa. It's the sugar acids by Cooper, George Cooper and Rios that have these very large uh, an anti-American enrichments, an anti-pure in some cases, and there seems to be a correlation with carbon number, which is really interesting. Perhaps related to the foremost reaction, yeah. uh, but the, the much higher, much higher excesses in the in the sugar acids. And it's interesting you see an excess of L-glutamic acid, but not L-aspartic acid. That's interesting, I think, as well. You know, I wonder why that is the case. You know. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a, 
a good point and an interesting question that we don't yet have an answer to uh, why that discrepancy exists, considering that they're both uh, dicarboxylic amino acids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, one CH2 different, that's all. You know, one right. carbon different. Mm -hmm. right. okay, th thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so our first question in the chat um, says, uh, it's not directed to a particular person, but um, it could potentially fit well with Ali's work. Um, what makes homochi homochiral polymers more stable than heterochiral polymers, I think it says. Um, so I'm not sure which polymers you might be talking about. If you're talking about the complexes that I was speaking about, we actually didn't see evidence um, that they were more stable. We saw that they basically had the same energetics. Um, so in theory, you should be making both. So our work didn't show one way or another. What we were hoping for originally and what our original hypothesis might have been was that all of those amino acids have different R groups. And depending on if you're using heterochiral or homochiral pepti or polymers, um, you might have a different orientation of those R groups that will allow different types of intermolecular forces that could influence the stability. So that was our hypothesis, but it didn't flush out that way. Um, so we don't actually see evidence that one is more stable over the other. Thanks. Um, the next question that we have um, is directed to towards Eric. So it says, uh, Eric, can you aqueously alter a meteorite in the laboratory to understand how the amino acid chirality changes with more heating and or water? Yeah, this is an interesting question. So um, I guess one could argue that in effect, we do aqueously alter the meteorite to some extent uh, and expose it to more heating when we do a hot water extraction. Um, but this process is quite a bit different than the aqueous alteration of the parent body of the meteorite. So the aqueous alteration of the parent body of the meteorite is typically something that uh, can occur over a range of temperatures and over a long period of uh, geological time. And it imp impacts the amino acid formation. Uh, so it, uh, it it affects the ability of precursors to come together and form amino acids. Whereas if we were to take a meteorite that's already been formed and already has a certain uh, organic chemistry attached to it, uh, and then we attempt to aqueously alter it in the laboratory, we might be changing the amino acid chemistry that we already started out with. And it's possible that you might be making new amino acids or different amino acids. Um, so I guess you could you could do a series of experiments where you're testing different temperatures and uh, different aqueous conditions to try to see how the already existing amino acid chemistry may be altered from there. Um, but in some ex some sense, we we do that uh, when we uh, do a hot water extraction. So, but we just haven't we just haven't played around with the parameters uh, so much to try to uh, mimic aqueous alteration in the lab. Perhaps it's something that uh, we or other groups uh, should consider doing in the future. Great, thank you, Eric. And um, and I, I noticed that Danny made a comment in the chat about that, you know, it's hard to replicate the conditions inside a parent body where aqueous alteration can last millions of years, but it's definitely something that seems to be, you know, people are interested in doing. Um, the next question we have is uh, for Ali Fox. Um, do you think minerals could have any role in the selection of L enantiomers for amino acids? Um, I love this question because actually my primary research is on organic mineral interactions. Uh, so we weren't really focusing on that in this project, but one of the cool things that I noticed while we were going through this is that the surface area of the molecules does change a lot based on which complex you're looking at. And so one of the things that I'd really like to do is um, look at how that surface area changes as a function of chirality and see if maybe we could see a preservation effect associated with the formation of these um, peptides. So if you have complexes that have a larger surface area for, for homochiral versus heterochiral, they might have a stronger organic mineral interaction. 
Um, and so that could potentially be playing a role as to why we see this um, homochirality in life today. But in terms of your actual question of do could minerals play a role in this, um, there's been a lot of work previously done that have shown that chiral mineral surfaces um, do select for uh, L enantiomers in the appropriate situation. So it's very possible if these reactions were occurring in the presence of some sort of chiral mineral surface that you could get selection that way. Um, our next question is for Eric. Uh, the question says, do you have suggestions for wet dry cycle amino acid polymerization experiments trying to investigate the role of exogenous meteoritic amino acids in polymerization on mineral surfaces? Any key components that you would incorporate based on meteorite abundances? Um, yeah, so I have some, some thoughts about this. So we've seen a lot of work in the literature about uh, wet-dry cycling and how it leads to polymerization. And the chemistry is always very interesting. Um, some of the laboratory experiments are um, not necessarily consistent with the conditions that we might see on a meteorite when it comes to organic uh, abundances. Um, if we were to try to extrapolate this type of wet dry cycling to uh, amino acids and trying to induce polymerization from, um, from meteoritic amino acids into peptides, uh, we would most likely have to be using uh, amino acid abundances that are more consistent with what's observed in the meteorite than what's necessarily reported in the literature uh, for laboratory based wet dry cycling where uh, concentrations of monomer units tend to be around 0.1 molar. In amino acids, we would tend to see monomer concentrations that might be three to six orders of magnitude lower than that. So if we were to try to go down this path, uh, we could use, uh, you know, just start with some simple amino acids like glycine and alanine. We could expand it to slightly more complex amino acids. Um, like some of the dicarboxylic acids. Uh, and we start off with smaller concentrations and do uh, wet dry cycling of that. Uh, now, when it comes to mineral uh, components that can be added in, certainly there's uh, minerals that can be used, um, um, iron sulfide type minerals uh, have been uh, studied in the meteorite literature for, uh, for quite a while now. Uh, and those could be useful for incorporating into uh, these types of polymerization studies to see if these mineral surfaces has help induce any polymerization. Um, and uh, uh, phosphorus based uh, minerals have also been detected in meteorites and those could be used uh, as well. So I would, I would point uh, an interested person in, in that direction uh, for ideas of how to go about structuring and developing uh, wet dry cycle polymerization experiments for meteorite relevant uh, species and abundances. Great, thanks Eric. And um, Ali and Danny, if you have anything to add, feel free to um, jump in too. So um, our next question is, um, well actually, one of our questions is, can I get the contact details of today's speakers? So if the three speakers are willing to have conversations after the after their talks, you can post your email address in the chat maybe, and then um, have post a seminar discussion that way. We also have um, a PC3 Slack group where um, post seminar discussion can continue. So we'll post that in the chat as well so that people can, um, join that PC3 Slack group and then have discussions about whatever related science uh, you're interested in. Um, we do have a qu another question um, from Ram. It says, given the fact that alpha hydroxy acids are always found with amino acids in prebiotic scenarios and the demonstration that hydroxy acids can play a role in peptide bond formation, can the chirality of hydroxy acids um, play a role as well. And so I think that's just directed to any of the speakers who might have insights. 
Um, I know from my perspective, you know, looking at our modeling results where we saw that the the chirality of the individual amino acids making up these complexes didn't really play a large role. Um, I don't necessarily think that you would see a strong correlation between the chirality of the hydroxy acids and the eventual formation of the peptide. Um, but what is interesting is the study that I cited from Fitz et al. in 2007, um, the glycine catalyst did have a really significant effect on the enantioselectivity of those reactions. And so, you know, if that comes down to, we just need to understand these mechanisms better. Um, and so it would be an interesting experiment to do. It's a good question. Great. Thank you. So I think um, that is all of our questions. Unless anyone has a final question, they can post it in the chat now, or you can raise your hand if that's quicker. We have a question from Kevin. Yeah. One last question for Eric about your amino acid extraction protocol. You use hot water, presumably under reflux for 24 hours. Have you tried, can you do room temperature with like dilute sodium hydroxide followed by then a neutralization to say pH, pH uh, seven or eight? Have you, is that much less efficient or does that give other problems by dissolving other sort of thing, things in the min, from the mineral matrices that may be there as well? Does that, would that then add to your post um, extraction purification problems? Yeah, Kevin, I think that would, uh, First of all, it's it's a uh, an extraction process I haven't tried in the lab. But if I'm thinking about the logistics of of doing it, I I would think that certainly you you could do that. I would expect there to be some difficulties, or maybe I shouldn't say difficulties, but some different challenges associated with uh, post extraction cleanup and purification due to the uh, the high basicity of the extraction solvent. Um, that would then have to be modified later on to get to a more neutral pH and mm -hmm. how the modification of the pH may alter uh, the chemistry of the organics being extracted. I certainly think you could do it, but I don't have the experience uh, with that type of process specifically to say um, necessarily what's going to, what, what types of um, impacts it will have, but I can, I can certainly hypothesize about what I would expect to see as a downstream product based on uh, my work with extraction of meteorites. So mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's a, a fair and an excellent question. And uh, I, I wish I had more experience with that specific type of extraction process to give you a little bit more of a crystal clear answer on that. Because mm -hmm. based on you know, in, inorganic chemistry, when we're trying to sort of like protect the amino group, you know, in peptide synthesis in the org organic lab, we always carry that out, the reaction with the sort of with, with a, an activated um, sort of like a carbonyl group. We, we always carry in basic solution. We always do because it basically deprotonates the when it's high pH is high, say around 11 plus it deprotonates the amino group. And right. I think you could, you could also do a derivatization at sort of certainly at pH, say pH 11 to 12 uh -huh. with um, one of those same group things that would then sort of cap the amino group and turn it into a more into a, a sort of more um, volatile, pro, volatile sort of derivative that you could see in GCMS. You know? Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. What do yeah. you use for your derivatization agents when you're looking for GCMS? What do you use? Do you use a tributyl silyl? Um, yeah, MTB-STFA yeah. Um, is often used uh, for amino acid derivatization for GCMS. Right. Okay. Like they did in Curiosity with, um, like they did. Yeah, that's right. Um, right. Okay. Thanks very much. Excellent. Okay. Great, thank you. And actually we have one more question in the chat. Um, it says status of peptide detection in meteorites um, and that they missed the talk. So apologies if it's already discussed. Um, I, can, I can chime in on this. So this is a, uh, this is a very excellent point. So uh, peptides have been reported to be detected back in 2002. Uh, by uh, Shimoyama and Ogasawara, they detected uh, linear glycylglycine, and I think they also detected uh, 
the 25 diketopapyrazine that's the um, cyclic glycine in both Murchison and a Yamato sample. They used GCMS to do that, um, and their detection was based off of a um, chromatographic peak and a quadruple mass spectrometer uh, M over Z measurement. Um, at the uh, AAL, we're, we're currently involved in uh, trying to study uh, peptides in present in meteorites. And I know there are some, there's some other groups out there that are working on it as well. Um, but there's only been one reported detection so far uh, of peptides and meteorites. Uh, and there's some ongoing work trying to confirm this detection and possibly expand upon it. So um, I think there will be more literature to, uh, to come out in the future, in the next uh, few years or so from a variety of different research groups that are actively involved in tackling this question, but it's a, a very interesting point and it's something that I think there's growing interest for in the meteorite, meteoritic organic community. Great. Um, we have a question uh, from Alejandro. It says, how far do you feel are we from the experiments of Pasteur and Marie Laurent regarding chirality? Um, yeah, does anyone have thoughts about that? Um, well, actually, I think I'd, uh, if Alejandro wouldn't mind giving a little bit more uh, clarification on uh, to, uh, to what extent uh, the question is referring to how far we, we think we are. Um, at, Certainly, since uh, chirality was discovered by uh, Pasteur a long time ago, um, you know we're not we don't have an explanation for how this type of homochirality uh, uh, could be developed in extraterrestrial settings. Um, so, I, I guess we haven't uh, moved a great deal in that extent. But if we look at it from another perspective, uh, in terms of our analytical capacity to be able to evaluate these types of concepts and um, understand them better. I think we've uh, gone tremendously uh, farther uh, from, from the days of, uh, of pasture discovering uh, chirality. So I would like a little bit more uh, clarification on how to address this issue before I think uh, I'd be able to give a little bit more uh, context. So I think, um, I mean, Alejandro, if you're, you're welcome to um, raise your hand and uh, ask or clarify on, on your microphone, or if, um, if not, then we will definitely just continue the discussion through the Slack just, uh, group afterwards. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's certainly an interesting discussion mm -hmm. point. I'd like to be able to uh, mm -hmm. share more if possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that sounds sounds great. And I think um, seeing as that's our last question in the chat, I think um, we will end there. And I just wanted to thank the speakers again for three really great talks and to everyone for attending. Um, it was a really great session. And um, before you all leave, um, James Iguchi is going to uh, start the poll. So if you if you're interested, you can answer these questions that are popping up on your screen right now. Um, and just, you should be able to select your primary field of research and your which continent you're viewing from and um, basically your career stage. I'll just give you maybe 30 seconds or so to answer that question or those three questions. And um, yeah, if, as you're finishing that off, just thank you again for attending and thanks again to our speakers. Um, be sure to check out the Slack group um, for any science discussions that you'd like to continue over there. And, um, and yeah, so we'll see you all in three weeks at our next 
seminar series and thank you again. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.